Ahmadi is an assistant professor in black politics at McGill University. Elle Jones is an assistant professor of political and Canadian studies at Mount St. Vincent University. And Julia Rogers is a PhD candidate studying patient-oriented health care and public engagement in the Department of Political Science at Dalhousie. They are three of the four lead authors of the high-profile and politically impactful report Defunding the Police, Defining the Way Forward for HRM. In our discussion, we certainly unpack that important document, but we also try to look at some of the historical roots of defunding and divestment as tools of achieving social justice. The complicated challenge of trying to gain public support for policies that strike the public as too radical because a prior set of cultural assumptions, ideologies, and biases blind many of us to the need to go radically in a different direction from the system that we currently have. A system that blindly wastes a fortune in public funds financing a broken status quo. We talk about the ongoing fiasco of the so-called Freedom Convoy that has terrorized Canadian cities and especially Ottawa for the last several weeks. They make it clear that the public's disgust with the response from political leaders and law enforcement should not just be read as necessarily about a desire for more authoritarian measures to keep the peace, though there's certainly a lot of that within Canadian public opinion. It should be seen as, first off, a moment where the police demonstrate they are here to uphold the social order, as Elle puts it, to protect white conservative movements. But it should also be interpreted as another example of a long history of ignoring white nationalism in Canada, in Julia's words. In many instances, social movements and counter protests organized by communities, these forces that exist outside the system, were able to accomplish what the police couldn't. This just confirms from their perspective that we need to go in a different direction. We need an alternative model of public safety that trusts communities enough to work in concert for the good. To quote a particularly powerful turn of phrase that Tari uses toward the end of this discussion, he makes that turn in the context of describing the defunding the police report as a quote, love letter to the city, and admits that love can be complex and conflictual, but due to the fact that the evacuation of love from the social in a carceral nation allows space for domination to exist, we need to re-engage with the public as an act of redemptive love. We do a lot of thinking here about the nature of politics in the present. What if, L suggests, we are mired in the nihilistic politics of just dunking on each other all the time? How do we find a way out of that go-nowhere dynamic of spectacularized, polarized politics? You know, while we have the beautiful language of imagining alternative futures, we might also still need to be really practical about which strategies work for transforming theory and social policies into action, into social fact. What if we could shift from the norm of police and politicians and corporations being split off from society and force them to be answerable to the public, to be intimately connected to the values of the vast majority of people? Wouldn't that be a real democracy? Things did not have to turn out this way and they could still change. But achieving that alteration of social reality will necessarily mean, as L teaches us, working to achieve that change at the social level. It's not going to happen without knowledge translation and civic engagement. As Julie succinctly puts it at one point, language matters so much in negotiating the attachment to authority that prevents many people from imagining a more radically democratic way of fostering healthy communities. So often, the struggle is less about, they say, the evidence and the data, and more about arguments, established doctrines, ideas that have been embedded in institutions for so long they come to count as unreflexive forms of common sense. Moving forward in a transformative way, they stress, might mean looking back in time at misremembered or deliberately forgotten movements. The voice of black women, for example, who Tari tells us were truth tellers in their time. You know, taking up their words and recognizing the prescience of their ideas rather than just producing the same violence while citing their names might be a more responsible way of doing this work. So I'll jump, you know, right into it. Um, first of all, thank you all three of you for for joining me. It's 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 staggering looking at this report that you've collaborated on, especially in the context of 
you know, the moment we're in where, you know, as Ted Rutland just wrote in The Breach, um, you know, Canada's 10 largest municipal and regional police forces will see budget increases in 2022, um, receiving an average of 3.7% more than last year. Um, you know, Montreal and Toronto city councils have passed the largest increases, 45 million and 25 million respectively. And like I start with the Rutland article because I think he sees an interesting connection between these increases and efforts by, as he puts it, quote, the police and their allies in, Can in Canada's major cities to work harder against majority public support for defunding to get the budget increases that they're used to. Um, and the way they're doing it is by using a well-worn strategy, just drum up fears that crime is running rampant. So in Montreal, the police, the police brotherhood, the media, a range of politicians um, trying to amplify a small increase in gun violence. You know, Toronto Mayor John Tory said last year that he would, quote, not compromise the safety of this city in order to appease people who believe that it would somehow be better to defund the police. Um, you know, in Edmonton, crime goes down and then the police chief says flatly without any data to back it up that the city has a crime problem. And that remind me, reminded me of a moment where, you know, in a conversation you just had recently with Sheldon McLeod, Tari, uh, where you say, like, the police are just not required to use evidence to justify their budgets. The chief of police, in fact, in, in Halifax has said he doesn't feel compelled to reference facts. Um, and this all, like, proves the worrisome point that you make in the report that, quote, lower levels of crime do not automatically translate into perceptions of safety. Um, so I want to ask, and it's a big one to start, um, does this mean, and this is to all of you, you know, um, does this mean from your perspective that there has to be this like deep and massive intervention that puts the notion of like the so-called thin blue line itself under scrutiny? I mean, you're talking about more civilian oversight and this notion that like, the state's monopoly on force is the only tool we can imagine, you know, what are the roots um, from your perspective of that sort of thinking about law enforcement and, and how can it be corrected? Thank you so much, Scott, uh, for kind of referencing uh, that piece in uh, with, with Sheldon. I think it's a really good point. What are the roots of it? As far as I can tell, I think there's three distinct uh, strains of, of kind of social trends um, that, historically and contemporaneously that lead us to a point where we can do paradoxical things where we can at once you know trumpet that crime is going down at the same time drum up all of these fears that crime is increasing and that the walls are closing in um so the first of these is again uh this kind of like amplification of a particular uh racial and settler colonial set settler colonial dynamic um that frames the other, the criminal, the marauder, um, as someone that is black or indigenous primarily, right? Like, and I think that that's, that's important foundationally to this conversation, right? When, we, when we're talking about quote unquote gun violence in Montreal, who are we talking about? Well, we're not talking about people that are living in their kind of middle-class suburbs or in the plateau, right? Like that's not what they're talking about. When they're talking about uh, an increase in gun violence in Halifax, they're not talking about, you know, uh, the people that are living in the South End, right? Like we, we know who they are constructing. They don't have to say who they are constructing to construct those people. So that's that's the first thing. I think that's the first kind of social trend. The second social trend, I think, is a increasing kind of individualization and quote unquote neoliberalization of what we might think of as community engagement, community services, and and the role of the state. Right when when we when we atomize when we push away from each other, it's a lot easier to start convincing each other that, you know, we're unsafe and we need this kind of force mobilizing around us uh, to keep us safe, i.e. the police, right? That becomes a lot easier to understand. It becomes an easier trend to justify. And I think the third dynamic here, and I think it's something that's really important, is this kind of co-optation of language, of evidence, right? Like, the, the cops are really, really good at pretending <laughs> that uh, the evidence that they're using is the evidence that is uh, useful, right? Like, they're, they're more than happy to ignore a uh, community voice. They're more than happy to ignore statistics that are inconvenient. They're more than happy to ignore polling data, and, we, and the list goes on. Um, right. They pick and choose what they share. Yeah. 
yeah, so I'll use that as a starting point and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. I'll let the others kind of jump in here. I mean, that gives us like that bigger picture. Uh, does anybody want to uh, jump in? Julia, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, I was just going to say like, kind of echoing some of the things that Tari said, but I think especially in terms of like public safety, there's a very narrow view of what people consider to be public safety initiatives. And I, I think a lot of people just consider it, it to be the police and that's the only thing keeping them or keeping their community safe. But it, it really has a much more broad scope and def definition, which, you know, are social services, you know, addiction services, services that help unhoused populations, even like community and neighborhood watches. So I, I think that, yeah, that really comes to a lot of the root of the problem is that people don't understand all the different elements that contribute to public safety and they just see it as like a very very narrow lens of like we need more police because we need our communities to be safe it's hard to convey the whole picture but i think that does like a, a good job um hell do you want to yeah like continue that thread at all yeah well, i mean we're seeing an example of this in ottawa right now where the police already had powers to police mm -hmm. right um they had the power to police from the moment the trucks entered the city and it's very clear in this case that there was also advanced intelligence that they already had, that they were extremist elements, and they didn't do anything. Of course, they always had the power to stop people from honking their horns. They always had the power to prevent all of that, did nothing for three weeks, and they're like, we need more officers. And then it looks like the only solution is what's happening now, which is, oh, we've escalated the number of officers. Now all these officers are coming into Ottawa. So giving the impression that, see, when we now have all the resources, the cops come in. But of course, the problem wasn't not having enough cops. The problem was the cops were refusing to enforce laws that already existed. Then there was an injunction against horns, and they refused to enforce that. There's so many videos online of you know, cops literally walking by people, breaking the law, cops sitting there while horns are honking, cops obviously hugging the protesters, mm -hmm. cops saying, I support you. And of course, this demonstrates that it isn't actually a resource problem. But I hate to quote Margaret Atwood, but as Margaret Atwood said, you know, and politically, I mean, like, you know, yeah, yeah. but as Margaret Atwood said on Twitter, this is exactly the playbook, both from the trucker, so-called trucker convoy and from the police, is that you let things descend into a state of anarchy and then the only solution becomes authority, right? Mm -hmm. So you go, well, now we just need more officers. And then for the Ottawa police, this somehow becomes a case for why they need more resources. Of course, as many of the people in Ottawa have pointed out, the police have been completely useless and complicit. At best, they've been incompetent. At worst, they're complicit. Of course, we know there's police and soldiers involved in this and like leading it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have many ordinary, like civil servant, middle class people saying, well, what the hell are we giving these people $328 million for when 25 people with bicycles could go out and effectively stop people? Mm -hmm. And the police, having been given extra powers, having been, you know, given extra resources, spent three weeks doing nothing. And of course, the answer is because what is happening in Ottawa upholds the social order. It is supported by police. Um, there was also the dynamic, and I don't want to get into the thing of defending high level, like black people who participate in state violence, such as black police chiefs, but we can speak about the reality, obviously, that the rank and file vehemently opposed Slally. Um, they had made racist memes of him. They had called him a Nazi in the past and made Nazi memes. They have been in more or less open rebellion of him since he arrived and was supposed to be addressing racism and community policing. So, you know, you also have these white men that refuse to take an order from a black chief. And I'm not defending him here. I don't want to do the thing we're seeing happening where suddenly all these black groups are like, oh, it's a public lynching because the man is the chief and he deserves to go. But you can also point out that part of this dynamic is white officers that were extremely resentful of him, not only because he's black, but because he's black and gently mentioned the existence of racism in society, right? Yeah. Um, and all of that should demonstrate to us that, you know, and people are like, well, why wouldn't the police do their jobs? The police were doing their jobs. That is their job. They exist to defend white conservative movements. They have always existed to kick in the heads of actual workers. They have always existed to defend capital. The only reason why they cleared the Windsor Bridge eventually was because the U.S. was like, get it together, guys, like you're messing with the trade, right? Mm -hmm. And then it had to be over. So you have many ordinary people in Ottawa saying defund the police now. That hashtag has been like bumping with liberals mm -hmm. being like, you know what? What the hell is going on? Um, you know, and like now they're handing out warnings. Everyone's like, okay, this is the 10th warning. Like, when are you going to actually enforce the law? Now, the problem with that, of course, is these are still people that believe in that some kind of ideal of enforcing the law, right? So this is where people aren't quite able to follow the thought through. So they're like, the police are totally incompetent. 
We resourced them to a huge amount. We've just given them a budget increase. They were completely unequipped for this task. Why don't they just do their job? It's like, you're almost there. You're almost there. Like they keep pushing. Yeah. They will never do it. Keep pushing, you know? And then of course we have this celebration of, oh good, they're bringing in more cops. Oh good, mm-hmm. the military measures. Oh good, soldiers, you know? So people are turning back despite seeing the failure of policing, they're seeing the failure of policing and somehow concluding that we just need more of this failure and more resources. So it's a very mixed response, which I think is, of course, common for when you're dealing with people trying to grapple with something that's so ingrained in our thinking and ingrained in society that it does take quite a bit of work, as you said, to start moving past that ideology. So people who are on the ground experiencing this and getting a firsthand look at, yes, this is why you should defund them, often then default to, well, maybe if these other authoritarian measures existed, maybe if we just had more authority, those authority figures would somehow make this okay, instead of realizing what was actually effective, which was community banding together, people going, I just watched a video of a guy with a pot, like banging in their faces, people on their balconies, right, showing us that public safety is actually enforced by us. When residents got fed up, they started pushing back. So um, it demonstrates both, of course, the failures of policing and then the ways that people continue to be just almost helplessly invested in the idea of the status quo, that there is nothing beyond policing and force, that there is nothing we can imagine beyond, well, maybe we should call in more police, maybe a different set of police, maybe the police with more powers, maybe police plus soldiers, instead of recognizing the fundamental problem as the police were never going to dislodge this because the police believe in it because it never upended anything that the police are actually scared of, which is indigenous people defending sovereignty, which is black people calling for a change to the social order, which is workers calling for unions. Those are the things they come out and crack heads with, not this. Yeah, you've cut to the chase. Like we do need to talk about the siege of Ottawa and what it means in terms of almost like a national identity crisis that's happening. Like that I hear people trying to communicate, you know, like, There is this sense, as Charmaine Nelson says, that Canada like imagines itself as a progressive country where this kind of thing like couldn't happen, Um, you know, but man, like we're we're being made to confront the ways that white supremacy constructs, as Tari was putting putting it, like racialized others as a kind of obstacle because of this far right freedom convoy, like well funded by wealthy American conservatives. In the end, it is about, as you say, upholding the white order. And this is the thing, like. There are some that are constructed as villains, but in this case, there are people being constructed as heroes. It is because it seems they champion a certain like rabid individualism. Um, And so like, you know, in this context, obviously we need to sort of indict the police, but it's not enough. Like Desmond Cole said today on Twitter, or he asked the question, are we really going to mourn the departure of black police overseers? If our objective is to defund and abolish police, why are we invested in, in black police leaders like slowly? Um, you know, so, and, and yeah, you're right that slowly has been vilified, uh, uh, in racialized ways, right? Like the, the sorts of accusations against him don't make a lot of sense. The idea that he yells a lot, like since when can't the police handle yelling? Like it makes no, no real sense. But I wonder at this point, like, what is your sense now of how we can overcome a certain kind of learned ignorance in this country, but I mean, there's a domino effect where we're seeing it happen, like trucker convoy, solidarity convoys in other countries, like this learning ignorance that is clearly endemic to white supremacy. Like I see it in people's aghast response to the images of this event, almost pretending like it couldn't happen uh, until they're forced to confront it. Like Cornell West just mocked that response in a live streamed CCPA lecture last night. I mean, how do you account for the shock, I guess, is the question. In Canada, there's been a long history of ignoring the reality of racism and white nationalism. And as Tucker Carlson said, it was, you know, he was talking about Canadian tyranny. And you saw on Twitter, it's like, the only Canadian tyranny I know is Canadian tire. And it's just, you know, like that, just that discourse, like this could never happen here when it happens here all the time. And we just ignore it. If it doesn't, you know, relate to us, we see it with indigenous communities, we see it with all of the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, these disruptions happen in Canada. But when it's white nationalists, all of a sudden the brakes are on and, you know, like this could never happen here. But yeah, it just it does. But it also gets to the point of people only see the only option to combat these as extreme measures, like more police, more military, because there's almost like an unimagined framework of anything else that could ever address this. And, you know, we have 
the Emergencies Act being invoked for the first time mm-hmm. ever since creation in 1988. And Still, even though we have these extreme measures, like we don't see any change in what's happening in Ottawa right now. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to the fact that, you know, Canadians just don't want to admit that there is fault in the system. And if you can't admit there's fault in the system, then you can't change it at all. Yeah. Um, and just to build off of that, um, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Lynn Jones's capacity to keep in the archives Um, the truth about the spaces that we're living in right and I'm so inspired by that as a form of activism because it's it's contesting the the primary mechanism of white supremacy in Canada which is erasure right like the the Canadian the the Canadian construction of this particular form of white supremacy is simply erasing quote-unquote social problems those of us who are perceived as social problems as if it never as if things never happened as if things never existed so we forget, for example, that in Halifax in the early 90s, a coalition of community members mobilized against the actual KKK, <laughs> uh, distributing l- literature and, and organizing to, to build weapons camps in Nova Scotia, right? Like this was happening in the early 90s. We forget all of these kinds of things. We forget these, these uh, moments in time because it's easier for us to forget mm-hmm. um, collectively and because this is in and of itself a tool of white supremacy um, in Canada. I think that's really important that like, when we start recognizing why it is that this continual surprise happens, it's not, it's not by accident, right? Surprise, this like shock is actually defensiveness. Um, and, I, and I think it's important to kind of unpack that and to address it where it sits. Um, so certainly as I think about what's going on right now, I think about history and I think about the histories that we have conveniently erased, that we've conveniently forgotten. Um, and and I, I, I think that a, a, a way to challenge this is by telling different histories. Like, let's, start, let's start sharing different stories. And let's start understanding that, again, in Halifax, when we wanted to mobilize against the KKK, we mobilized as a community. We did not rely on the police mm-hmm. to suddenly evict these people. The community mobilized to do that, right? Like, uh, it's just so frustrating to me um, to to see this kind of very uh, placid uh, version of this country being spat out again and again and again. Yeah. And then, sorry, I just wanted to make two points. One on the history point, I was on a seminar yesterday with Andrea Ritchie and she was doing a a kind of um, retrospective of defunding materials and one of the things she pointed out now I didn't know this discourse is being used in the states because the discourse we get here is that defunding is American and it's something that we've just adopted but I guess the discourse in the states is that this is actually only uh, you know naive white people living in the suburbs and not actually a demand from black people and actual black people want the police because they're getting shot all the time right so one of the things she was showing is that defunding demands are not new and have been part of black movements going back to slavery. People in slavery called for boycotts for cutting off the money to the South. What is that but defunding, right? Mm -hmm. People understood that you had to choke the South out and that you didn't continue to put money into harmful systems. There were defunding demands in slavery. The Panthers 10 point plan includes a defunding demand, put the money into housing, education, jobs, and communities. That is defunding. Um, So, The apartheid movement was a defunding movement, right? Don't fund South Africa. Don't fund their police. Don't fund the apartheid regime. Remove your funds. So justice movements throughout history have always had a defunding demand, sometimes called divesting or boycotting, right? Um, And it's only being treated as this new radical, nobody's heard of it, because of course, part of this is that black social movements and black ideas are always treated as fringe and as not part of the intellectual landscape. So you can live as a white person and be unaware that defunding demands go back centuries, decades, right? And then pretend that this is some new, you know, woke idea that isn't backed by anything. And then the second point I want to make, which is related, and I want to dig a little deeper here and suggest that The point with policing in Canada isn't that people are ignorant of it. The fact is that quite, and this is in the rights adoption of the word freedom. It is explicitly freedom for white people, policing for us. I've pointed this out online. When Dr. Ingola was identified falsely as having spread COVID in New Brunswick and run out of the province with racist death threats, there was no convoy that said, oh, wait, this is a violent, and by the premier, right? Premier Higgs 
like more or less named him, did everything short of saying his actual name, refused to apologize when made aware of his error. That man got run out on death threats. I am going to guess many of the same people making those death threats then are the same people talking Freedom Convoy today, right? When a black international student was incarcerated in PEI because he had a mental health crisis and broke COVID quarantine. There was no convoy. The only people that spoke up about that were Black people. Black people spent particularly the early part of the pandemic speaking out repeatedly about policing the pandemic and how that you, you can't police your way out of the disease and how most of the finding and uh, policing was going to Black and Indigenous communities. In Ottawa, people may remember that a school trustee accosted a Black boy playing basketball by himself himself alone threatened to call the police on him and ruin his future. I don't remember the white convoy being like, wait, that's an overstep of mandate. This happened to us over and over again. And it's not an inconsistency. And part of the problem in Canada is I think people get stuck on the politics of hypocrisy. And that's not just in Canada, it's everywhere. That like dunking on the libs or dunking on the cons, but that's the extent of people's politics. So people just sort of sit there and go, you would be cracking heads if it was BLM. But it's not an hypocrisy. It actually matches. It's not that, oh, let me call you out on this. I mean, this is actually the roots of policing. And the, the freedom was never for us. There would never be a convoy to North Preston to defend us when the premier and Dr. Strang spoke up again. That was fine. The same people that support the convoy attacked us for defending North Preston because policing is always okay for us. They believe in policing for us. They believe in policing the borders to stop migrants. They, none of these people said that street checks was an overstep of police mandate. The same people that are screaming about, oh my God, you can't bring down police powers on white people are fine with the way that we have lived under a black skin mandate in this country for generations. And that is actually seen as a normal order of things. As long If they were only policing us, if they said only black people have vaccine mandates, there wouldn't be a problem. That would be fine. You know how we spread disease right? It's only that it is white people's imagined freedoms, which are never based in this sense, in this white right-wing way, are not about collective freedoms. They're not about the freedom to protect each other. They're not about you give up some freedom so you can enter into a collective state of care. They're about, as many people have said, this kind of action movie imagining of yourself as Rambo, the sole person who solely screams against an unjust society, unbacked by any real movement, right? And this individual vision that separates itself from worker movements and, and has to take no accountability. It's not like these people even have to say, well, we thought policing was okay. Now we're experiencing, you're right. Black people are actually right to talk about street checks. I'm sorry I sent you threats. They will never do that, right? Because they're not sorry they sent us threats. So the thing is that people get very stuck on sort of this superficial level where they'll point out, oh, you know, indigenous heads would be rolling right now. Indigenous people can't do that without digging deeper and saying, and why is that? This isn't some surface thing. This is the root of policing. And this is exactly why policing reforms and training and anti-bias won't don't get at the root because the root of policing has always been to leave us in a state of unfreedom, including people who do drugs, indigenous people, sex workers, gay and trans people, people with mental health are always outside this vision of freedom. And it is only for some of us. And it is only when they are perceived freedoms that are not actually, you know, they're not actually experiencing oppression, but then they get to, to act out. So I think the problem is, is a very deep unwillingness to engage with these political truths. So people just sort of stay on this like gotcha surface, like of finger pointing and and not actually wanting to do the, the work of digging deeper and saying, why is it that some people's freedoms matter and some people's don't? How is that embedded in our society? How is that actually normal? And how is that actually seen through all of our institutions? And how is this like construct of white vigilantism like so capable of of like still resonating right in certain ways like it's this it's this costume that we saw people wear on January 6 when you know they siege the capital like there is the as assuming of a specific kind of costume that is about you know um the the kind of you know mercenary individual and it it has this kind of purchase right and and yeah i like that you're talking about like the deep history of uh, divestment movements and these kind of forgotten interventions and ignored connections um, at the same time as kind of outing the superficiality of a lot of the analysis around like just the hypocrisy, right? Like digging deeper reveals uh, um, like a long continuum of this sort of like unequal grievability of lives. I, I think you've re recently mentioned, L that, you know, uh, um, you know, it being Black History Month, um, there is this specific heroism attached to seeking justice through sort of sacrifice 
And I wanted to talk about that particular sort of like sanitized history in a sense, or like superficial history, um, right? Like one that just reduces it to a certain kind of Afro pessimism, you might say, that is just purely about struggle, um, you know, not really providing a whole picture. Like Tari, you wrote a short article a little while ago titled Thinking Differently About Black History Month, where you talk about the various routines that the month tends to inspire in Canada. Um, you know, proclamations of unity and understanding, references to Pan-Africanism and quotations of civil rights icons like Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, you say these acts do not achieve their stated goal of acknowledging the challenges that African Canadians face and that these toothless acknowledgments of discrimination's past even risk becoming apologies that ignore ongoing harm. Um, could you maybe speak to whether this Black History Month in 2022 you know, feels different in any way, or if it's, it's still about, as you put it, diversity seminars and empty, empty gestures, like how, what did you mean, I guess, when you said like, we should use the opportunity created by Black History Month to work differently? Well, I mean, for me, I, whether there's been much change in 2022, um, I don't really think so. I'm, I'm seeing, for example, people trying to uh, take up for uh, Chief Slowly, uh, calling it, you know, invoking the term lynching, when you know he's a, just because he's black uh does not mean that he's not still a police overseer right like uh and i recognize that that's not necessarily coherent but i think it just speaks to the kind of the, the frustration of this kind of mealy mouthed small l liberal approach um to addressing the uh ongoing harms that this society produces, but not just the ongoing harms this society produces, but the kind of uh, counter to that, which has always been a vibrant and and a liberatory vi vision of what our communities could be, right? That marinage, um, if I'm going to go back that far. I, I just, I get so frustrated with the idea that we can invoke the quote unquote heroes of the past um, without number one, really listening to what they said without number two, taking up what it is that they were attempting to do, applying those lessons to today and actually fighting for something. And number three, expect that a state that only seeks to harm us um, in real time um, would ever do anything different unless we force it to, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I was really trying to say by that is that we need to take the opportunity, whatever opportunity it is, whether it's February 21st or November 15th, right? Like it doesn't matter what time it is, but we need to take an opportunity to actually set out an affirmative vision for a different and liberatory world, right? We actually need to do something. We cannot simply complain about what is not being done and we cannot rely on the state to do to make that world for us. And so I think that that's very consistent with the idea of defunding. I think it's very consistent with the kind of mobilization that we've certainly tried to be a part of and that many people across the country are trying to be a part of, right? We're trying to actually build something different. Um, and I think that oftentimes in African Heritage Month, it, 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 it ends up being more of the same. I hope that kind of clarifies that comment. Totally, yeah. Um, I don't know if people had other thoughts. If Elle, you wanted to speak to the, yeah. Yeah, I've frequently sort of made the sarcastic joke that Black History Month is where we commend uh, dead Black radicals while continuing to exclude and cancel the live Black radicals living in our own communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and especially for Black women. I mean, it's it's very true that Black women's work most often only comes into being once they are dead. You know, Claudia Cumberbatch Jones being revived now. Uh, it took... Um, Zora Neale Hurston till the 1970s for her work to be recognized. Um, you know, there's so many Black women theorists and writers that live their lives. I mean, when you read Claudia Cumberbatch's Jones's work, like it, this is stuff that is is resonating now that she's talking about intersectional movements, and it was just buried, right? Um, my own aunt Marion, I was looking back in in like the 1960s in London, they were organizing, you know, an immigrant group, and then she left the group talking about how too many like middle class students and professors were in, were trying to lead this movement and not caring about the rights of migrants. Like she was talking about what we would now say is like neoliberal bourgeois black organizing in the 1960s. Um, you know, and this work is so often buried, the work that in particular black women have been doing. And then this is relevant because I think many people are very much, and this goes back to what I was saying before, that people sort of just surface like 
let's point out a hypocrisy. Many people, I think, are very stuck in a politics of nihilism, which extends mostly to owning the libs or, you know, so there's been a number of articles in, you know, saying, oh, why isn't the left doing something? Why doesn't the left organize? Why isn't the left doing something? Because everything has to just come down to the left, right? Like, uh, we have white supremacists funded by international forces, particularly the right-wing forces in the States organizing and what people want to spend their time in is being, well, that's because the left is too concerned with being woke. Like this is what it always comes down to for people. I used to watch a lot of these um, political like YouTube shows and I stopped watching them because there was never a point where they talked to organizers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they would endlessly be like the Democratic Party. You know, I agree with them, obviously, but then it never moved past that point. OK, so if the Democratic Party isn't working for you and voting isn't working for you, what exists outside that system? People can't go there. Right. So what do we learn from people at Amazon organizing? Let's talk about that. Maybe instead of endlessly expecting Kamala Harris to do something when she's never built to do something, maybe you should go invest in the Amazon organizers. Mm -hmm. People are unable to make that step. So to bring this back to the defunding report, which I'm actually supposed to be talking about, <laughs> you know, and we're all like talking about the politics. Um, but I didn't say that in a sarcastic way. I mean, like we've taken this other places, but this is part of what goes into this is one of the things that we wanted to show is this is, in fact, very practical social policy. This idea of consistently designating every sound social idea as woke or extreme or ponies and fairy dust. And sometimes we play into this on the left because we often use the language of imagining, which is a very beautiful language. But I think what it leaves out is that it, it concedes this ground that what we are speaking about is somehow theoretical or imaginary and pie in the sky. But then in the real world, you just really need more cops to pour into Ottawa, right? When in fact, these are very practical things. So what is different about this report than other defunding documents, which we also relied on, right? This is part of a whole discourse. But I think what this report uniquely contributes is we're saying that this actually isn't some pie in the sky that we're just imagining for a lifetime that we never have to get to. It is doable. And the fact that it isn't being done is because of deliberate choices being made by bodies when the police board chooses not to make policy. And we're seeing this in Ottawa again, if we want to go back to Ottawa, like the complete chaos of the board. When City councils abrogate their responsibilities when everyone accepts that the police chief can come before them with no graphs and just give them more money and then be like, but, you know, what do we do? So it's also to intervene in that and say, let's stop pretending that this is radical. Let's admit that what has been radical has been defunding society for decades, defunding things that used to be pillars of society that we considered that everybody should have a pension. That was we all believe that if you worked your whole life, you deserve to die in dignity. We don't believe that anymore in the last 30, 40 years, we've, you know, and especially in the last 10 years. And that's not supposed to be radical. That is normal. And even conservative is considered. And then it's radical and ridiculous and unhinged and anarchic to say, why don't we start reversing some of these social trends? So one of the things you want to do in this report is be very practical that way. Here's the data. Here's the recommendations. Let's stop pretending that what is being done is normal and inevitable. And let's admit that there are very real things we can do to intervene that make sense, that are sound social policy, that are grounded in research. And so let's not now let people continue to pretend that this is beyond them and they just don't know. Now we know what to do. We have some ideas of some paths. There are others we certainly don't control. You know, we haven't done every recommendation possible, but it puts on the table the idea that this is actually reasonable social policy. And we're not going to concede the ground that it's something ridiculous or for the next, for 10 lifetimes from now. Yeah, um, so much there, obviously. And I wanted to connect it to uh, a book I just interviewed some people about, Abolition Feminism Now. In that book, they write that, quote, abolition will not end all harm or interpersonal violence, but it can expose the fact that what we have, prisons, policing, punishment, is not a just, efficient, or moral solution to the problems that shape violence in our communities. And, you know, I, I do want to hear more about, like, what you think is fraught about the language of imagination. You kind of gestured to it. But, like, you know, there is something captivating about it that is worth using. And I see it as a thing that you're both, like, using and critiquing here and there, like, strategically. And I guess on that question of strategy, like, during your January 17th presentation to the Board of Police Commissioners, L, uh, you know, I noticed that there were, like, a few moments where you are especially aware of the need to make these ideas that you're presenting, that all, all of you are presenting, sort of bridgeable uh, in a sense. Like you're aware that you're addressing multiple publics that will have completely different ways of taking in the information. And one framing that I noticed you use a few times is that these ideas are not radical. And I, you know, I'm just curious about that sort of rhetorical tactic, if it is a rhetorical tactic, 
you know, what it is about the word radical that makes it so vulnerable to attacks. I mean, it's like become this dirty word that you're repurposing in strategic ways to politicize the system of mass incarceration by saying, you know, the system of mass incarceration is radical. It's not helping people. So like, is it about trying to translate the language of imagination into a conversation about economics? And like, to what extent is being too radical generative? And to what extent does it like delay things? I don't have a problem with being radical. I'm obviously, I mean, I've, you know, but my point is that we actually do ourselves a disservice when we pretend that ideas that are well-established, that have a long history, that have been effective in all kinds of social movements are new. Okay. And one of the things that I think has happened in 2020 is a lot of people and, and beyond is you have a lot of people showing up brand new, right? A lot of people pretending that there's never, so, you know, we have people saying historical things like this is the biggest movement for social justice of our times. It's like, did you forget apartheid? Like mm -hmm. anti-apartheid movement? Like, you know, like 80% of a country hit the streets. That is, far outweighs what we saw in the States. So I think particularly driven by and by a very short attention span, driven by social media, you know, everything that happens now is brand new and the best thing for two days. And then there's the next best thing that's the best thing you've ever seen. And I think that also creeps into a lot of organizing culture where, um, and this is not to, for example, um, denigrate youth activism. There are amazing youth activists, like youth have so much energy, but there's a sometimes a very particular fixation on extreme youth and activism by media, which I think is a deliberate uh, tactic by the state to induce amnesia about movements that came before us, mm -hmm. to remove the idea that our elders have been here on these blocks for decades doing this exact stuff. Nothing in 2022 is new. Nothing we are saying is new. Like everything we're saying has been said a thousand times before. If you are black in 2022, you are not saying new things. But that people come to this brand new without having done their homework. And then we speak about how is this is a new idea. And I think that does a disservice to the fact that we're part of a hundreds year long social movement. And we are using tactics and strategies that are well worn. The reason why abolition was chosen as a word to encompass this movement was because it deliberately referenced the movement against slavery, one of the largest social movements of our time, the movement to abolish slavery. And it was making that connection. We have done this before. So I don't object to the word radical. I just don't think we should apply it to things that actually aren't necessarily radical. And I'm saying what is actually radical is the society we are living in now. This is unprecedented. It is unprecedented to have a society so disinvested from its seniors. And we are seeing this with the pandemic, the sick society that we have allowed to accumulate. Uh, corporate wealth is, is no, you know, people say this, that uh, Adam Smith would be appalled at, at corporations and how they exist today. This is not what he meant, right? Um, so many people of the past would be like, what is going on? This is completely radical to have these billionaires funding their own private, you know, policing movements, as we see with like corporations like Amazon, which is one like the biggest investor in police technologies. Somebody did an investigation showing that, um, you know, police foundations are increasingly getting money from corporations like Enbridge. Uh, oil companies are giving heavily into police foundations, and the police are using this rhetoric of defunding, saying, "Well, we may be defunded," and turning to corporations to get this like private wealth. Um, you know, that is radical. The idea of an oil company funding a police force is an extremely radical social move that is completely disconnected from how everyone who imagines democracy in European terms, not even in other terms, in like basic European political theory, people understood things like this, mm -hmm. that the police and politicians, you know, like corporations shouldn't be like connected to politicians. They shouldn't be a private force. They need to be publicly accountable. And we're shifting from that. So I think that we allow conservatives a lot of ground. In fact, we had a conservative come at us and, and basically claim because our uh, recommendations made sense that they were therefore conservative. And it's like, sure, if they do, then the failure is on your side. Why are you honking your horns in the street instead of advocating to get police policies made public? Agreed. I think conservatives should think that it's appalling that we just download these budgets with no data, with no proof that it works, with literally no relationship to reality. We don't have to have any accountability. They wouldn't accept that from an arts body but we accept it from the people that are carrying guns on their hips. That is radical. So I just want us, I'm not demonizing the word radical here. No, no. I'm just saying that, you know, I think, yes, like it is not imaginary that you can release 41% of people from jail during the pandemic without a spike in crime because we did that. That is not imaginary. Right. It is practical and we did it. If it's not the world we want to build, it is like a possibility now. It's like, it's a reality now. So um, that's the only thing I mean in that, um, mm -hmm. when I, I say that. 
is that I think it is important as part of shifting the conversation on defunding is to stop pretending that these things aren't doable to stop pretending that they're not realities, because they are. And everybody can see that the police are not mental health workers and shouldn't show up on mental health calls and kill people when they do, yet is unwilling or um, finds it hard to make the step to just say, so get rid of them. You don't need to cling to this. But of course, we have, you know, decades of cop Lego, you know, from the time we're little, the cop Lego Mm -hmm. and the Paw Patrol dog and the Playmobile jail and, you know, the the 50 percent of crime shows you watch on TV and the true crime podcast, you know, and all of that is very difficult. I'm not making fun of people for struggling to make their ways past these ideas. They have been ingrained in us in very real ways. This has not just been a monetary shift. It has been an ideological shift that has told us that punishment is the solution, that authority is needed. We see it all over the place that, you know, when you feel unsafe and threatened, you have to reach to this higher authority that has this gun or this law or this military or this emergency measure, and they will keep you safe. And until we're doing the work to sort of move people past that and really sit and say, well, okay, but talk me through this. Why is this working? Why don't we see further than this? Can you imagine something else? And that's why we talk about things like participatory budgeting. People need to be given the space to think these things through and work them through. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter if I say this, like I can say it all I want. It has to be on a social level because the shift has always been on a social level. I'm talking really long, so somebody else jump in. Yeah, I just, I really wanted to touch on something that Elle talked about. Just, I think we're really guilty of this in academia, which is we bring up these new ideas and market them as like really new and cutting edge. And the fact is that they've existed forever. I mean, you see it with like, language right now it's like intersectionality and and ethnographic research public engagement is pivotal and important to you know expanding our understandings of certain issues these things have always existed we're just not looking backward we're always looking forward but we're not looking at any context historically and you know i was thinking about this in terms of like when we're talking about radical we're talking about defunding and how there's all this contest or um, conflict between people that's not a new issue either. There's always been an us versus them mindset, especially when you're talking about like radical quote unquote issues. I think back to like the AIDS crisis and, you know, no matter how much science and how much, how much evidence was brought forward about this being a global issue, it was always labeled as like a gay issue. Mm-hmm. And then really that rhetoric didn't change even if you presented a bunch of different evidence that, that disproved that. And I see that with the term defunding as well, which is no matter how much evidence you can bring forward, it seems like people get hung up on language. But if we go back to the convoy really quickly, you look at some of the strategies that they presented, like de-risking in terms of limiting bank accounts, people seemed for better or for worse to completely understand that idea and completely understand how that would help the situation right now. But if you were to flip that language and put it in a defunding context, all of a sudden you'd have all this outrage. So when we're presenting the report, presenting the findings, one of the ways to have a more cohesive and less conflict-driven argument about the process of defunding, because again, as Elle and Tari have both said, these are not new issues. These are, you know, defunding has been seen to work time and time again in, in different conflicts. But if we we're omitting the language of radical, we are omitting the language of defunding and putting it in more broad terms with, with different ways of like contextualizing it, it seemed to be more approachable to people. And we saw that throughout the crafting our report, when you look at all the public engagement data, you see people completely against defunding, but then in their other answers that they give, understanding it in a different way. Mm-hmm. So just language matters so much. And especially when we're just doing like this very forward thinking and not looking at the past. Yeah. It it just matters to contextualizing and helping to like have a more broad audience that aren't immediately just looking to have conflict and be like, it, you know, it is us versus them. It's the liberals versus conservatives. We're not going to listen to anyone based on this single terminology for some reason. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Um, You know, this assumption that, you know, in academia, especially that in just like, naming neoliberalism as the source of all of these problems, you're going to sort of, sort of like awaken people with your particular formulation of that idea. It's like, it's not necessarily connected to anything and it, it reeks of opportunism. I mean, it doesn't actually engage with the ways that as Elle was sort of saying, like these neoliberal crisis measures are like extreme as, as it kind of gasps for life, you know? 
Uh, Tari, did you have anything you were sitting on that you wanted to add there? Yeah, um, I actually want to pick pick up on precisely that point, right? The idea that we are in the most extreme and most crisis-driven moment um, that one could imagine, but it's not for the reasons that people would identify, right? Like, uh, it, it just strikes me as so um, fundamentally absurd that when we watch the kind of contradictions and comp- and kind of like, uh, imbalances of the state warp in on themselves, right? Like we're watching things uh, fold in on themselves. We're watching places flood, sea levels rise. <laughs> like the world feels like it's ending and yet we're kind of doubling down on the same kinds of things for them to turn around and look at the people that are saying, hi, maybe we shouldn't keep like running into the like wall of bullets that's coming towards us <laughs> figuratively uh, to look at those people as radical. It just... It, it, it boggles the mind. Uh, so that's one piece that I wanted to go back to. Something else that Elle said is that, like, you know, one of the things that our movements end up doing is erasing the work of our elders. Um, yeah, I, I truly, I truly believe that if we don't start understanding the role of lineage um, and the role of of tradition, and I'm not saying tradition in this kind of very kind of like archaic. Um, stoic sense that this is the only way we can do things and we only listen to these people and we only listen to these people that articulate these things in these ways but instead what we do is we understand that these social problems have been around for a very long period of time that there have been many attempts historically to contest these problems and to build something different and we might want to understand what happened there and try to build upon those attempts i think that if we don't do that then 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 we again we've seeded that ground we've said that in fact the only quote-unquote evidence that matters is the evidence that is most beneficial to those that would seek to destroy and harm us right Mm -hmm. so i i'm really encouraged by the quote-unquote unearthing of particularly as Elle said, Black women, Black women who are ra- quote-unquote radicals again, but, but Black women who are truth-tellers in their time about the ways that movements function, about the brokenness of the state, about the brokenness of the state as experienced by those that are most harmed by it. I'm encouraged by that in unearthing, but what I want to say is that that's not enough, that we need to like, okay, take those lessons and actually do something with them. Let's not just reproduce the same violence while citing those names. So I think that, yeah, as it relates to our defunding report, we offered a a suite of public policy and that's 50% of the battle. Now the other 50% is like making that happen. So we, we, we always knew that simply writing a report was never going to be enough. Uh, we knew that writing a report means that oftentimes those reports get mothballed, they get put on a shelf and never uh, spoken about again. We, we, we had these discussions going into the process, but what we decided to do was we decided to engage in a community-driven process where no, no financial gains were made, no kind of embeddedness within the state was made. What we wanted to do was offer the community a blueprint that it itself created and now start to mobilize people to act upon that blueprint. So this is this is the piece where we're learning. We're learning from people that have tried to do this in the past. We're learning um, and we're pushing in ways that that matter for the people that we're engaging with. And so, yeah, the you know, the conservatives can say, "Well, this isn't radical," and I'm like, "Okay, cool." <laughs> like, <laughs> they, you know, they 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 chastise us for uh, not doing as uh, we claim we're doing. Yeah. Quite frankly, we're trying to build a better space for, for everyone to live in. You're sort of like putting aside this sort of binary notion of like winning and losing there and just talking about what it means to first define defunding. And then as the research, uh, as the report points out, like moving to the challenge of finding consensus yeah. a, around, as, it, as the report says, like what roles belong to the police, what exists to replace police services and ideas of safety and risk. I wonder just like in terms of the language here, what role just like making budgeting more democratic plays? I mean, in general, there is a widespread sense that these decisions are and maybe even should be made by 
experts behind closed doors or something like they're going to allocate money in rational ways. But as we're learning, the actual work of determining which services get funding and which just dry out due to austerity is like deeply cultural, interpersonal, communicational work. This is something that I, I see you writing about, Elle, in your open letter to the police board. Like the, the things that you state are, you know, ask the HRP not to provide a budget that has misleading graphs or indicators. You ask for more advanced notice uh, so that budgets can pass, can't just pass through invisibly. You insist that the CAO and the chief not be able to speak at public consultation meetings and quote, especially not to undermine public input or sentiments. Like that is about the sort of like the communications challenge of like pushing these measures through, like getting some kind of momentum going. Um, how do you negotiate that? Um, just to be clear, that was a collective letter. It's just because my name has an examiner thing set up. <laughs> it was under my name, but right. we, we all wrote it together. But Tari, I think, and Julia, this is actually, I think, both in your guys' areas kind of explicitly. So did you want to take that? Yeah, I just really, one of the things that bugs me so much is when people say that, well, policy creators and deliberators are the experts. So they should be entrusted to make these decisions about not only public policy, but decisions. But again, this baffles my mind because it's, do you think that every decision that every bureaucrat or every public policy person has ever made is the right decision? Because I can think of dozens of ways that there's been missteps by the government in terms of like money allocation and choices for, you know, particular rollouts of healthcare and other social services. So just to say that experts should be entrusted to make these decisions just has such a like blind spot of the vast poor choices that government has made. And also it just it makes me wonder what people think is going to happen if the public has a discourse and particularly how budgets are made. Like mm. do you think that there's going to be like such a like misuse or mistrust of how they're going to allocate budgets when really the people when there's public input it's about better serving your community it takes away the vested or like you know government interests of a budget or a policy it really puts all the focus on community and having a better community rollout that better addresses the needs of people and you know of the daily lives that are affected by policies and budgets so yeah it's it's just one of those things that it, mm -hmm. the actual argument just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, just to pick up on that, have you seen a police board meeting? Like, well, where, where's the expertise? <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not there, I promise you. Like, like, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I'm just saying that they're, they're trying to figure it out like everybody else is, right? Like, I... Um, I have lectured in a school of public policy, right? Like public policy is this incredibly contested thing that has oftentimes very little to do with evidence and a lot to do with the kinds of arguments that people can make. There are doctrines, there are ideas that are embedded in institutions over extended periods of time. And those doctrines end up governing a lot of the decisions that people make. Oh, well, you know... We're the progressive conservatives, so, you know, generally speaking, we have to kind of make sure that we, well, actually not in Nova Scotia, but <laughs> in other places, we have to make sure that we, like, balance our budgets and, you know, like, ultimately fiscal responsibility is the best thing. Well, okay, great, cool. Like, you've, you've made a particular argument based on a particular doctrine and a particular idea of vision of the way that the world works. Evidence does not come into that equation once. And so the briefing notes that people get are often based around the kinds of things that would justify the ideas that were already in place. All of that is to suggest that, in fact, including the public in, mo in uh, processes of budgeting and in processes of policy construction um, and implementation is, in fact, uh, kind of like right-siding this imbalance, right? That it's, it's addressing this very obvious and very broken mechanism within many of our governmental systems, which is that it's in fact doctrines that win the day. It's the, it's the norm entrepreneurs that win the day. It's not necessarily the evidence. It's not the experiences of community members. It's not, it's not the, the, the lifeblood that actually <laughs> makes the whole thing go. Um, so yeah, I just, the, I, I think that the idea of communication and the idea of participatory budgeting is huge here. It's why we did not choose to append a dollar amount 
because we're not going to reproduce those harmful processes. We're going to involve people. We're going to hear what they have to say. And yes, they might not have a massive amount of exposure to the idea of budgeting, but they have a lot of exposure into the kinds of lives that (laughs) they lead. And that matters, that ought to matter in the policymaking process. Beyond that, I mean, the whole point of we don't do what Plato does, right? We don't just appoint a body of, you know, the most elite people to govern society. The whole point of a democracy is that, yes, you know, somebody who has spent their life um, in retail can run for office, right? Um, We don't require that you have policy experience or that you are a lawyer for good reason, right? You don't want a government made up of academics or lawyers. You want people with a vast you know, that all kinds of life experiences that represent the life experiences of other people. But then, of course, what happens that is very anti-democratic that people don't really think about is, therefore, um, when people come in new to government and you have this immense amount of, you know, stuff you have to wait through, it's the clerks that are unelected. It's those people, it's the city CAO that have the power, right? So you have ordinary mm-hmm. people who rightfully so are elected by other ordinary people to represent them as ordinary people. And then you get to government and your ordinary person doesn't, it's not like we learn how to write a bill in high school, you know? So you're relying on this whole apparatus of unelected bureaucrats who actually are the people pulling the strings, actually are the people writing policy, actually are the people making directions. And when people are like, okay, I'm new here, what should I do? You're told what to do. Like the city lawyers are like, this is how you make a motion. And they're the same lawyers that are advising the police. And so people don't really think about that. This is like profoundly anti-democratic, particularly in how bodies like city council or a police board work. They're very dependent on the long-term staff. And we don't have a choice over who's in that position. We don't vote for the city CAO. We have no idea what their experiences are, what their, their ideas are, and they drive a lot of this. So it actually makes very good sense to involve the rest of the public. Because I, I don't expect my MP, they don't have to be, yeah, like I don't need them to be a PhD in political studies. I need them to be caring about the neighborhood, right? They, I want them to bring their life experience and they I want them to be making arguments for the the lives that real people live and that can involve also all of us right so if we concede that I didn't elect my MP because I thought they were an expert in policy I elected them because I think they're a good person who you know uh, represents things that I think and feel why doesn't it make sense to say why don't we all jump in on this in budgeting why are they suddenly the second so the day before they're elected they didn't have any expertise and they did they're elected they suddenly are now a massive expert so we just defer to these elected officials to make decisions for us? Like, how does that work? This is exactly why the public should be involved. To advise our city councillors, to advise our police board members, to say, you know, no, you're not thinking of this. Because why would that person know all of that? Yeah, and I think that spirit of like trusting the public, it, it is throughout the entire fabric of this document. And like one of the most powerful ideas in the report is the sense that you know, the project of defunding the police is not about withdrawing social programs or trying to somehow undermine the provision of public safety. You, you say over and over again in, in media engagements around this report that it is a positive project. You know, it's like it's, it's not it, and, and it's also a project that doesn't just ignore the fact that, quote, policing reflects social inequality. You know, Mariam, Mariam Kaba puts it this way. The abolition of the prison industrial complex is, quote, a vision of a restructured society in a world where we have everything we need, food, shelter, education, health, art, beauty, clean water, and more. You know, it's a vision that comes from, you know, reading the document, like a recalibration of safety and accountability that's based in that that trust of the public and, and and a desire to sort of diminish this like fixation on crime rates. Uh, I, and, you know, you gestured this a minute ago, Tari, like I'm thinking about this in relationship to your sort of admission, L, if you can call it that, during the presentation to the Board of Police Commissioners that you can't assign a budget value to mental health services because figuring those things out is a step by step process. So, like, how do you think about how to communicate what can be gained here? Like, and what are you learning about what works and what doesn't in terms of that sort of positive politics is it's like something that sort of Trudeau has been associated with despite the you know Janice faced nature of his politics right like how do you negotiate that sort of I don't know push and pull of focusing on what's you know these entrenched problems in society but then fundamentally what can be gained by recalibrating these things I'll start briefly I mean part of this is we are always in this space I mean I've been advocating my whole life for things that are initially received with violence with threats with dismissal with being called 
you know, crazy, the endless crazy that is applied to you mm. and then have later been adopted. You know, when we said that policing was racist, that was crazy. And now it's just accepted. People have shifted what they think the solution is. But, you know, you will find outside of, you know, some very extreme voices, the average person now agrees that, you know, because we have all these reports that, yes, OK, poli- racial profiling exists. That's something we actually had to argue for. People used to dismiss that. Right. It doesn't happen Mm -hmm. in Canada. Our previous police chief, Blaze, was saying this was the Ferguson effect and it didn't happen in Canada. It was just that we were like watching American media and wanted to believe these things happened to us. And then, of course, comprehensively it's been shown it happened. So this isn't new that in particular black people have always um, taken up social policy, have always been denigrated for it up to being arrested, you know, and assassinated for this policy that then becomes adopted as good policy and, and what everybody accepts and the way society should be later. And those people are held up to us in Black History Month is why can't you just be like Dr. King? Why, why are you talking about the funny? You know, like, so, mm-hmm. so I don't think it's new. I think we've always had to build resilient communities. We've always had to, um, you know, stick to our guns and bring people in and be patient and show grace. Like black women spend our whole lives showing grace to people. You know, we spend our whole lives being patient with people. So I think it's also just how things are done. You know, like how did our grandmothers get stuff done? How did our grandmothers build consensus in their communities as negotiators, as mediators, as people in their homes that had to, you know, fight through not having humanity in society. Um, So in that sense, I don't know. Yeah. Like if we say, okay, it's positive politics, also just practical. People aren't going to agree with you. I've lived my whole life with people screaming at me and telling me I'm, you know, like harassing me. And then later on, the things that I've been saying saying have been proven to be true. So we know that we have to commit to that. Mm -hmm. We, We have to believe in the idea. It's not about, yes, like dunking on people on social media or owning the libs or owning the cons or, yeah, the nihilistic politics of just pointing out that, the liberals are failing at this. Like that's not how we actually get politics done at the level of the deep caring work that is communal work. If we want to build collectives, we have to do it with faith. We have a lot of, I don't mean religious faith. I mean the faith that this work means something in collectivity with other people through relationship building, through humility and listening and reflection through taking the advice of our elders who are here before us through reading and humility to the previous ideas that came to us and then um, doing the constant work of having conversations with people trying to find the language that works with people trying this in a new way like well maybe if we we try this way you know we, we have always done that so I think that yeah the danger is also if you just believe you have all the answers and um, you know like if, if tomorrow aliens came down and they're like, Elle's in charge, you know, would that be a good thing? No, you know, like, Elle, you just get to do everything you want, unchecked, now we'll have a society. Like, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't work. We always have to be engaged in this space of, um, you know, people shifting ideas, like believing that ideas can be shifted because otherwise we don't do that hard organizing work every day to say, well, where else? Where can unions help us? Where can workers help us? Where can people that maybe don't agree on this area, but agree on this area. So let's try and agree on that area first. And then we can work from there. Like we're always finding those spaces. And, you know, as a black woman, I get framed as, you know, angry and divisive and all these things. But um, the actual work I do and that all of us do is based in a deep care and love. We didn't get paid for this work. No, yeah. We did this work for our community because we believe that things can be different, that change is a reality and a necessity. And for that to happen, people have to sacrifice um, time and energy. People have to be willing to have some courage of conviction. Um, Like these are just realities that are are given to us by those who came before us as well. So I appreciate your patience uh, and your power. I mean, the the words have power. Does I mean, does anyone want to pick up that thread? No, I, I, I just wanted to very quickly say that, yeah, uh, just taking very quickly up from what I was talking about, and uh, Julia, please feel free to add on to this, but, you know, we called it a love letter to the city because that's exactly what it is. Because, like, it, when, for me, when you love someone, you, tr- you trust you trust uh, someone enough that, that you believe in their capacity to ultimately work in concert with you for the good. Mm. So... This, to me, you know, we, we could call it positive politics, but what it really is, is a deep and abiding trust in a place that I think all of us love. And yeah, love is complex and it's conflictual and it's difficult sometimes. And sometimes you have to have screaming arguments, sometimes you have to do this. But like, if you don't, if you don't care, if you don't show that kind of love and that kind of affection, well, that, yeah, then that, then there's a, a sense 
there, there's a space for domination to be fostered in, in, in a space when love does not exist, in my opinion. Mm. So, like, I know that sounds very high-minded and very flighty, but I think it's very practical. I think that, in fact, when you care, as Elle said, when you, when you love and when you care and when you, when you put forth that love and care, you do things like this, because why else would you do it? And, you know, the late Bell Hooks underscored love is the source of that sort of collective freedom that is about, you know, care and collective survival and so on. Like, uh, but sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Julie, if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I kind of just want to tie back to everything that we've kind of been talking about this entire time. But, you know, public engagement is not a new concept. It's not something that we just kind of pulled from thin air. And you mentioned Trudeau earlier when he came to power in 2016. He had the uh, open and accountable government document, which outlined how much that they were going to focus on engagement and talking to people and talking to citizens when making policy. And then we see they run one town hall campaign for electoral reform and then scrap it, even though something like 83% of people they engage with agree with electoral reform. So we've just continually seen engagement branded as something that we do, but it's really a tokenistic process that doesn't actually account for anything. And it just seems to be a standard that we're just going to allow this democratic deficit to happen where there's no real connection of people and policies and budgets and decision making. And I mean, I, I look in the Halifax context and we, they, particularly the police board, um, wants evidence of why public engagement should be, you know, championed and considered important. Well, like I, I walk around the city and I see the decisions that a public service that is not elected, as Elle said, has made. And, you know, to reference Parks and Rec, like I just see a bunch of ice town mistakes being made time and time again here with money. And so I think that, you know, we've exhausted the current system that we have. It's not reflective of the city that we love, of the people that we love, of the communities that we want to uphold and allow to flourish. So why would we stick with the status quo if it just keeps creating more and more damage to the place, the people, the communities that we love? so much to like think about and still process but i i think i'm gonna let you go i just out of respect for your time i i just want to say like this is such a mobilizing document like it is it is clear that the function of the report is to inspire further movement to make these connections to reach back and to reach out for connections uh all of the concepts that it introduces and the data it uncovers like you're making clear it's just the first step and that it's important to link this report to movements elsewhere. Um, and I just hope you've had a chance to appreciate uh, what you've done. I mean, it's not, it's by no means a simple task. Like, I hope you've had a chance to celebrate your success at at least moving the needle. So thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us.